Welcome everybody to The Elegant Life. My name is Erin Kurt and I am a spiritual teacher and energy healer who assists women from around the world in how to both live and manifest an exquisite life for themselves. And I've been doing a series that I hope, this is my intention for the series, that you are inspired to use your talents, your natural abilities, the way you were specifically and purposefully created to create an income for yourself, whether it be a full-time income or a part-time income, whatever it is, I want you to know that you weren't given those talents for no reason. And to show you how many different people are actually doing this in their own life, my hope is that it inspires you that it's possible, that it exists, and that you should really just give it a try. So today, I have brought on another beautiful soul who I just learned about recently, the coolest job, <laughs> and her name is Hazel. And I'll let you introduce yourself and give you a little bit of a, a brief introduction of how you got to do what you do and exactly describe what you do what you do. Okay, so I'll hand it over to you right now. Yes, my name is Hazel and I have the wonderful job of being a cruise ship speaker. And, and when I tell people that, they're always intrigued because they have no concept of what it is. I got into this about 11 years ago. My background was actually banking. I did 20 years in banking, totally different life. It was very stressful, very high pressured. And I was in a situation where I was actually being bullied by my boss and it got very unpleasant. And I was close to a nervous breakdown wow. and I decided I just had to get out. I just couldn't cope with it anymore. Now, thankfully, at that time, they were actually offering redundancy packages. So I was able to take a package, yay, pay <laughs> off the mortgage, which solved one big problem. Oh, great. Yes. So that then, that then left me with a, a huge vacuum. What was I going to do? Because I'd worked full time for 20 years, leaving at seven in the morning, getting back at seven at night. And that's all I had done. But the one thing I had found when I was working was I was earning good money, but I never had any time to enjoy it. And that was a big oh, light bulb moment. Can I just stop you here? Because sure. already I have goosebumps. There's so many gems in here right now. Okay, first off, can I ask you, do you remember, did you make the decision that I'm done with this? And then the redundancy packages came? Or did it help you make your decision? It was kind of a, a slower process than that. It was probably a 12 month process reaching. I, I was getting to the point where I was thinking I need to get out, but the, okay. the finances was an issue. How was I going to manage if I didn't have a salary? And then the redundancy packages happened to come up. So it was kind of um, good but timing. But it was in and your, that, it was, yeah, it was in your energy system. You were, you were thinking, you know, so you kind of put the, the thought intention out there, but you were like, yeah. I don't know how, but this is what I tell ladies. You don't yeah. always have to know how you just no. have to allow that desire to be present. Yeah. And say, I mean, had the, universe, I had the packages not come up, then I probably wouldn't have jumped. I probably would have thought I've got to stay in the safe job with the salary and put up with the crap. Thankfully, I didn't have to do that. Now, at that point, I had no idea what I was going to do. I thought, well, I'll take a year out. I want to finish my degree. I'd got several little projects that I've been putting off that I wanted to do. And at that point, I hadn't even cruised, I hadn't been on a ship. So I had no concept like everybody else of where I was going. But soon after that, we actually went on our very first cruise as passengers. And I just loved the whole concept of cruising. So a couple of years after the, taking the redundancy, I was sort of, I'd done my degree, I'd done the part-time job, I'd done some work for the church, and I'd done all these little bits of things. Um, but I thought, you know, I need to start looking for something more proper, as it were. But what I wanted to do was travel. That was my great goal. And I thought, well, you either get a full-time job, earn the money 
to pay for traveling, which is what most people do, of course, but then you only have limited holidays in a year time off. So that was one option. But then just quite by chance, I happened on a cruise to be talking to a cruise ship speaker. And he said, well, I get a couple of free cruises a year in return for doing the talks. And then that started me thinking, well, sometimes you don't have to do things a traditional way. I was fortunate in that, A, I paid the mortgage off with the redundancy package. I was unfortunate in that my father died, but he left me some money, which again gave me a financial cushion, for which I was very grateful. Um, I have no children, no dependents, so I, I could be a little more fluid in what I did. I had no responsibilities as such. So as long as I could feed myself and whatever, um, that was okay. I didn't have to worry too much. So yes, it was a, a very slow process actually getting into it. Uh, the biggest downfall is now whilst I call it a job, it's not actually paid. I don't get paid for doing it. How does that all work then? Okay. So essentially, I get a free cruise for myself and a guest. So obviously, oh. there's a value to that, but it doesn't pay your bills. Right. So I had to have that financial cushion. I then had to generate some income to pay my gas bill and pay for the food on my table and so on. So I've developed sort of a side business, as it were, doing local talks and I speak to local groups. I probably do, in a normal year, I do two of those a week, which is enough to just cover my expenses. So how did you come up with the idea? It, it, when they say cruise ship speaker, is, is that what that gentleman was doing as well? Or did you kind of create your own niche in that? No, he, he, was, he was a destination speaker, which is what I do. Cruise ships tend to have depending on the length of the voyage, perhaps three or four different lecturers on board. One will usually talk about the destinations, so telling you where you're going, what you can do, what you can see, maybe selling the excursions, depending on the cruise line. And then the other speakers will be more general topics. So you tend to get a military historian or somebody who talks about famous people or somebody who talks about music. And there'll be a variety, and often that's linked with the itinerary. If you're going to Norway, you'll get somebody who talks about geology and maybe myths and trolls and things like that. Although sometimes they get that a little bit wrong. And I do remember once we went to South America and we had a man talking about polar bears and we thought, well, we're not going to see a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's a little bit bizarre. They do try and link it. So yeah, so this man was a destination speaker um, and he, so that he got these free cruises. So I thought, well, that's one way of doing it. But I had to balance how I paid my bills. Local speaking, how do you, wh what do you talk about? Do you talk about the area? No, I have, I have a series of talks that I use locally. Um, I have a series which I call Fascinating Lives. And I cover Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Frida Kahlo, Friedrich Nansen, who was a polar explorer and Eva Perron, they're my fascinating Ooh. lives. Now, obviously they all link into cruise itineraries very often as well. So I can also use them on the ships. And then I also have uh, talks about some of my travels, a tour we did to India, the trip around South America. So some of the more interesting journeys that we've done. And then I've also got another talk, which I call Motion of the Ocean, which just tells people about my life, how I got into this and some of the tales of my travels. That one keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> it's about five hours now. <laughs> Part two tomorrow yeah. night. That is just gorgeous. So how do you promote these talks that you just decided to come up with? The, the local talks, well, I, I have a Facebook page, I have a website. Also, you find that if you speak to one group in the county, say one women's group in the county, and you do a good job, they will tell their counterparts in other groups, and it just kind of snowballs. Uh, and I get invited back, which is great. So, you know, that's, wow. that's, a, that's a testament then, if you get invited back you know, you did a good job. So yeah, it's, that's word of mouth to a large degree. This is one of the things that I'm wanting to share with women in this series and with, with everything that I teach. When a woman is doing something that brings her joy, she becomes magnetic. Mm -hmm. People like to be around that person. People that's like to listen. That's true, yeah. Isn't it? 
doesn't sound like you've done heavy duty marketing plans and business plans. No, and no. So that I really want women to hear that it can be done. And we've yes. been trying to live in a masculine world. And although there can be some women who, who really were programmed to fit into those systems quite well, um, they too still need the balance because I get a lot of them coming to me who are like, where's the joy? I'm burning out. But anyway, we won't yeah. go there. So sticking with the joy part, what would you say is the, the part of your job that brings you the most joy? I love the travel. I love going to new places and so on. But I also love the whole social experience of it. I mean, I live alone, so life can be quite solitary, or it particularly has this year. And I love being on the ship and talking to people. And you're right, it's a good opener. We sit on a dining table, perhaps with six strangers, and then somebody will say, what do you do? And you say, and it just opens up the conversation because people have no concept if I'd said oh, I work in a bank they would have gone oh yeah okay end of and story that's, that's, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah other than telling you their bank horror story but yeah uh, but now it, it instantly sparks a conversation and we never have a problem with a conversation at a dinner table and it's not and just them asking me I can then say well where do you like where was your favorite place and it just yes yes and what I love is that you're doing something that you love. And it's like you're by just by talking about what you do, you're bringing joy to their lives because it's almost don't you feel like they become awakened? Like that's a thing that exists. Yes. How exciting. And then they might start thinking about traveling more or yes, you know, absolutely. Other yeah. it's a win, 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 win situation. Mm. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Gosh. A lot of people okay. think it's a very easy role. Um, they think you just get on the ship and give a talk or maybe even that the talk is given to you. But for every talk I give, there's probably 50 hours of work behind it, putting it together. And I, I, I approach wow. it in a very professional way, even though I'm not paid. I'm very perfectionist about it and it has to be the best it can be, which gives me the confidence to deliver it. Um, and I, I have yes. had a lot of people who've said to me, oh, I'd like to do that. And you, you talk to them and, you, and then they, they decide it's not for them. It's not a free cruise in that sense because the work is behind. Yeah. Leading up to this year, I did hours and hours and hours of work writing talks for which, of course, all the cruises were cancelled, you know, and who knows if I'll ever use them again. I hope I will, but I've probably wasted, well, not wasted, but probably had four months solid work that hasn't paid off because, and that, because I'm not paid in terms of the trip doing it. I do feel it will be used, so it yes, won't I'm be sure. for nothing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Getting into this whole new endeavor, let's uh -huh. call it, were there any obstacles that you came up upon that you didn't expect that you kind of, ooh, even internal ones? Because I think uh, I know from speaking with women, the internal ones are often the biggest struggles. It's not yeah. necessarily the external, right. but did you come up with anything? There were two areas, really. First of all, the first agent that I signed up with uh, was a nice gentleman but a little old-fashioned and didn't really think it was a job for a lady um, and he tended to appoint people who were like him he was a military historian so most of his speakers were gentlemen over 70 who had some sort of military background oh wow um so i i wasn't male i wasn't over 70 and i'd never been in the military and i couldn't do a lot about any of those well apart from <laughs> wait till i'm 70 <laughs> So I immediately felt that I was struggling to justify myself. And I think that's why I worked so hard in the early days, because I had to prove uh -huh. to him that I could do it. Um, I'm probably one of the youngest speakers on that circuit as well, because most people can't afford to do it until they retire properly. And a lot mm. of people do it as a retirement hobby, as it were. So that that was a battle, the old sort of glass ceiling in a way, the fact that I didn't fit the mould. Um, right. I think I've proved that I can do it. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. it. You just, it, it, you just it, glow it. when you talk about it. So <laughs> well, I, just, I just love it. The other hard thing that came out of it was the fact that my marriage broke up because of it. Uh, my husband didn't want me traveling, couldn't accept that I was changing because I was changing. I was, was very oppressed in the bank, very downtrodden, very low. But of course, I came out and as you say, I've just blossomed. And he 
couldn't handle that and and the marriage broke up because he tried to stop me doing it and that just made me want it even more whereas if he'd actually encouraged me I probably would have been happy with two cruises a year but because he was trying to stop me I just took everything I could and it just got messy so so yeah there's there's a sadness there there was a huge price that I've paid yet at the same time is the freedom inside to just be you and not let anybody decide who you need to be yeah. isn't the freedom in that just oh absolutely I'm glad you mentioned that too Hazel because I think that sometimes we can get a Pollyanna view, like, well, I'm just going to go after things that bring me joy and mm-hmm. everything's going to be smooth and work mm-hmm. out. And, and the thing that I'm, I, I say to women, even me at, at the level that I am, every, I mean, we're just designed to want to expand. I mm. mean, you can't stop it. It's part of our nature. So we'll always want to expand to an area where we've never been before. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. For us, it's uncomfortable for those around us. And it is a period of growth where you really see, I mean, you saw the contrast of what Mm -hmm. you could have, and it would be the same old, same old, but that was comfortable. Mm -hmm. Or you could go over here where the unknowns are this, you know, you weren't being respected over there, yet there was something inside that just was like, this is what I want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's it's a period. And I think it's it's important to I me. Mean, did you have any support as you were going through that, whether by girlfriends or professional yes, I, support? Or I had, my mom and my sister were great. And also, I mean, my friends tend to be rather scattered because we all live in different parts of the world but email support and so on um so yes there were there were people there for me which I appreciated that's important well speaking of you know women going after their their dreams what advice since you just described you know this kind of internal motivation that you had what advice would you give to women who are just at that point where you were so many years ago saying I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to do something. And I know it's not going to be perfect, but I want to be happy. So what would you give them as advice? I think you have to think it through. Think about the different options. Think about the financial side, because that often is the driver for most people. But think about whether you can do that in a different way. I realise that life is not about amassing as much money as you can. Life is about making enough money to live. And I appreciate it's different if you have children. I realise that. But for me, I realise you either work to take your travels or you travel, make it your work. Um, and and you, you find the difference. And then you have to find the way to plug the financial gap by doing something different. The other thing I've been doing during lockdown, because I realise that because of course the local talks have dried up this year, so I've had no income whatsoever. I realised I have to have another income stream. So I've cashed in part of my pension pot. I have bought the apartment next door. I've done it up and hopefully that will bring me rental income come the new year, which gives me just another little cushion if, if something like this happens again. You just realise you've got to have options, a range of options, rather than having one income stream. It's better to have five smaller streams this is exactly what i tell women and any Mm. woman that went through the elegant life makeover with me last year this is exactly what i was telling them Mm. every every wealthy person or successful person or person that is is living life the way they they want hopefully has multiple streams of income Mm -hmm. but because the the stress goes away if one thing goes that's it. You don't want that. And the feminine way of dealing with money is passive income, mm-hmm. is multiple streams of income. Mm. So you're doing, you're, you're doing, you know, you're flowing very well with your intuition and just moving towards things. Yeah. It's, that's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's so important for women to think it through, but realize also that there could be another different way and if they don't Mm -hmm. have anybody then you know maybe brainstorm with other people that that could be something as well that's Mm. great Mm. this is a question that I ask everybody and you might have already answered this but I'll see if you have anything else to add to it a lot of women even the women who who I coach who are deemed outer world successful Mm -hmm. 
have inside of them something that we call the imposter syndrome. Like, yeah, I'm doing this now, but oh my God, if they ever find out that I am not as good as that person, or if mm -hmm. they ever find out that, you know, did you ever have a moment of thinking like, I'm living this kind of life, but God, if anybody finds out that, I, you know, like, just did you ever oh, have yeah. a moment of some kind of this, who am I? to live this kind of a life or yeah, something. I, yeah, there's a degree of me that doesn't believe I'm doing it. When people say, oh, that's amazing. I think, yes, it is. And how did I get to be there? When I was in the bank, as I said, I was quite oppressed and so on. And I had no confidence. And the thought of standing on a stage making a lecture would have, would have just blown my mind. And I remember speaking on the Queen Mary too, which of course is the large Cunard ship, very prestigious, thousand people in the theater. And afterwards, I, I came off the stage and I was with my mum on that particular trip. And I said, did I just do that? And she went, yes, you did. <laughs> I just couldn't believe how it. How did you overcome it? How did you, how did you do it? Because you must have been scared. Part, partly losing weight. I lo after I'd left the bank, I lost a lot of weight and that started to give me confidence. Um, right. I was doing some work for the church at that point as an administrator. Um, but because I had a little bit more confidence, I was at one time asked to speak at the conference, another time in the cathedral, and you just keep going. But the first few times I spoke on stage, I was a bag of nerves. I remember the very first time I didn't have a glass of water because I didn't realise that my mouth would dry up. And I remember just sort of clacking all the way through it because my mouth was so dry. <laughs> Yeah, you learn. Yes, things. yeah. I mean, the first, oh, I don't know, five, six, ten cruises perhaps were just horrendous. The nerves were awful, but every one gets you a little bit closer. And because I prepare so thoroughly, I know that there's probably not a question I can't answer. And if they ask me something totally off the wall, you you have a, a set answer. That's really interesting. I'll find out about that for you. Or, oh, nobody's ever told me that before. Thank you so much. And you just you learn how to handle those questions. Yes. See, this is a very good point that you're making as well, because when other women, and I know you've probably been there too, when you see someone doing a great job, you think, well, they must have always been that way. Exactly. And the thing is, when you do something that you don't know, I mean, I used to talk about when I was first a school teacher, I used to take the teacher's manual and what they would tell me to ask the kids, I would just be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want to get it wrong. Now, I tend to attract people who are like I used to be, which is very type A perfectionist personality. So mm -hmm. I know I'm speaking to a lot of women out there that if you feel like you have to be perfect on the first time, you're not going to be, okay? Mm -hmm. You'll be you'll be good. You might make a couple of fumbles, but every single time you do it, you'll build the confidence muscle. Yes. And without a fail of a doubt, like I'm sure that someone could call you tomorrow and you would go into an environment that you don't know and you would just go and say, mm -hmm. speak on, Audrey, right? Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so what I used to do at the end, I used to, um, after I had my children, I would I was just substitute teaching because I didn't want to have any pressure of, you know, the regular job. I chose when I wanted to work. And I would go into a high school. I would go into an elementary. I would go into a primary school. And they would just like leave me sometimes not even a really good plan. It was basically throw that. I'm just going to do the whole day. Uh -huh. To think that I went from holding a book up going, what does it say to ask now? You know, to just let's do this yeah. you know it just i want women to know that we all go through this this is yeah. part of a journey so just accept that the first time the second time maybe even the third time is not mm -hmm. going to be perfection you're gonna it do grows. it grows it grows, and it grows. Mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. perfect i'm so you're bringing up all the points i ever wanted to <laughs> know, women. this is fabulous okay so my final question for you is where do you see this endeavor going? Do you have any dreams, hopes, or have you felt an expansion coming up within you where you're like, hmm, I kind of see or would like to take this somewhere? For me, it's not so much how the role will grow. It's the, it's the where, where will I go? I've been focusing uh -huh. on the Americas the last few, because obviously when I go to a new area, it's very difficult because you don't have the experience to talk about it. 
So you have to grow your territory very slowly. So I've been focusing on the Americas for the last probably four or five years, but I need to start going to Asia and learning about Asia and developing that way. But it's a huge ask when they say, can you go and talk about that area and you've never ever been and have no concept of the culture right. or anything. So yeah, that's, that's the, always the challenge is to how to get to a new area and still be convincing and, and know the area. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, it, 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 it is a real where for me, but not so much an internal one, but an external one. So you see, you're happy with it. I mean, I, we had talked a little bit before this and it feels like you're really missing this endeavor. Oh, because my word, I am, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just sounds like it's not necessarily an expansion in terms of you know, something changing or growing. It's just simply let me get just back, get back. <laughs> and just keep doing even more of it. Yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I will it. appreciate it so much more. All the little things that we've said, oh, we missed this. We missed that. We miss dressing up in an evening. We miss our ballroom dancing. We miss the lovely oh. food. And yeah, we just miss it all. Here's to 2021. This, yes. These next couple of weeks are going to be a little bit intense, but 2021, it is going to come we'll, out of this. We yes, we'll start expect- getting yes. Yes. Hazel, just thank you so much for sharing yet another unique, a unique way of living life. And one thing I know for sure that came out of this whole COVID experience is that people realized much what I realized when I went and lived in France, that life is about living and experiencing Mm -hmm. It is not always, this is the very masculine model, goal, get, only work for that and Mm -hmm. missing out on the living part. You work to live or you work to live in exactly the same time like you do. Mm. (laughs) The options are there. And I, my hope, ladies, please in the comments below, tell me if, Hazel has inspired you to do something that's been in your heart and in your mind. Uh, we'd love to we'd love to hear about that. So on that note, thank you again and ladies go out and make it an elegant day, an elegant week and I will see you next time.